Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is uh, Chetan Kapoor. Uh, I'm a product manager with uh, AWS. I'm specifically a part of the uh, EC2 team um, and super excited here to uh, get to present with uh, Adrian and Mike with Toyota Research Institute. Uh, Adrian and Mike are going to do most of the talking. Uh, the session is around uh, helping you guys understand uh, you know, how TRI uh, is using AWS to actually build um, you know, autonomous vehicles, uh, specifically focusing on their uh, computer vision, um, you know, a portion of their stack, um, and, and training it uh, you know, using uh, AWS infrastructure. Uh, so to get started, uh, you know, I'm going to kick it off. Uh, I'll just give a really quick overview. You know, most of you guys hopefully got a chance to attend the keynote, uh, so I'm not going to be repetitive there. Um, and then, you know, I'll hand it over to uh, Adrian and Mike uh, to kind of share um, their experience using, using AWS um, and some of the cool things that TRI in general uh, is working on. Uh, to get started, uh, you know, our mission, uh, as Andy Jassy described in our keynote this morning, uh, is to actually put machine learning in hands of uh, you know, every developer and every data scientist, right? Uh, we see ML and AI uh, changing what we build, uh, you know, how we build it, uh, and in some cases, even why we build, right? So we're seeing a lot of customers uh, that are, in some cases, reinventing their businesses um, or actually innovating uh, on the new technologies and capabilities of, of ML in general. Uh, so at, at Amazon, we've got a long history, um, you know, uh, going back several decades uh, using you know, early forms of machine learning. Uh, you know, right from, you know, if you visit our, our, our e-commerce website uh, where, where you see personalized recommendations um, to our you know, invent, inventory automation and management systems, uh, to some of the, you know, the cooler ones around, you know, drones and Alexa with the voice-driven interactions, um, and then finally some of our latest uh, work around uh, Amazon Go, uh, where we are totally reinventing the customer experience with checkout-free uh, shopping experiences, right? Uh, so we've been doing this, uh, you know, over 20 years now, um, and this pace and this, this, this market just continues to excite us. Uh, especially based on all the work that you know, customers like yourselves are doing. Now, before we get too deep into the session, uh, how many of you guys are already using machine learning? Show of hands. Good, about half. Um, and I'm guessing the rest are here to kind of learn more about autonomous driving and machine learning. Is that correct? So how many are just here to kind of learn more? Great, so really good balance. Um, so again, uh, you know, Andy shared a version of the slide this morning. Um, and this obviously needs to be updated based on all the announcements we, we made. Uh, but at least from the ML stack perspective, uh, we believe that in order to kind of deliver on our mission, we have to provide you know, developers like yourselves, customers like yourselves, a really broad selections of tools, regardless of where you are in your ML journey, right? Uh, so if you're a developer, you know, just getting started with using machine learning, uh, you know, starting with our high-level application services such as recognition, uh, you know, poly, transcribe, translate, it's probably the best starting ground, right? Uh, these services come with machine learning models pre-trained and ready to go uh, and are available for you to kind of start handing over data to actually make predictions or inferences, right? Now, uh, if you're more of an in the expert realm, then you probably want to start looking at you know, the platform layer and even the layer below that, which is the framework layer. Um, in the platform layer, uh, we actually abstract away the infrastructure uh, with a service uh, called uh, Amazon SageMaker, uh, where it actually provides an end-to-end -end solution uh, for building, training, and actually deploying your machine learning models, right? And then uh, if you're an expert and if you want to really go into the, the details of optimizing frameworks, uh, how you train your machine learning models, how you tweak your, your performance and optimizations, uh, that's where we also have a lot of innovations across the frameworks we support, uh, the infrastructure that we have, uh, which is primarily based on our P3 instances, uh, which are backed by NVIDIA's uh, latest GPUs. Um, and all in all, this, this stack is all just meant around giving you the ultimate flexibility uh, to build the application that you want the way you want it. Uh, now, bringing it back to, you know, what we want to discuss today. Um, so when it comes to development of a machine learning application, uh, this is where I'm talking about developers that are in the middle layer or even the layer below, uh, where you actually go through the process of defining your models, optimizing it, training it, specific to your applications. This basically starts with data, right? 
So you need to have data in order to actually train your machine learning models. And once you have that, you can actually optimize its performance, optimize its, its accuracy, uh, uh, gonna add more features to it. Um, and this process is very iterative, right? Uh, you know, if you find a new data set that is interesting and you wanna use it uh, to enhance your accuracy, you know, you wanna use, it, use that as soon as possible. And you know, in the past, or at least looking back about three or four years back, um, the time it took to train your models was in some cases measured in days, right? In, in one of the cases, uh, you know, back in 2012, the winning entry for one of the competitions just took about a week to train uh, and there were you know, rounds of applauses when people kind of published that paper that you were actually able to train your model in a week and actually get a better accuracy than what a human will give you, right? So then, and, and over the years, you know, when, when ML has kind of picked up in adoption, uh, people have started to talk about like, why does it take, for, uh, take, my, take it so long for, uh, for my machine learning model to get trained? Uh, and it, essentially it actually limits how quickly uh, you can bring some new innovations or new capabilities uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your offering because you know, it's all the time that actually takes to train machine learning models. Uh, so with the P3 instances that we launched in October of last year, uh, we, we were kind of first to kind of bring uh, NVIDIA's latest GPUs uh, coupled with uh, you know, uh, a really strong uh, you know, framework support, um, you know, GPU to GPU interconnects to really help customers optimize the time to train. Um, you know, Adrian and Mike will talk about it where, you know, they'll talk about, you know, what it meant for their applications, but we saw cases where training times went down from days to hours. And that was a big win for our customers, and we're super excited about that. Um, another area of focus is, like, now, if you're down from days to hours, that's great, but why do you want to stop there? Like, why should your development process be gated by how quickly and efficiently you can train your machine learning model. Uh, so the, another area besides just focusing on the hardware and the instances that we have been focusing on uh, is how to scale out performance um, across multiple GPU compute nodes uh, using distributed training. So this has been exciting. You know, our goal over here is to actually cut down uh, training times from hours to actually less than an hour and hopefully to a few minutes. Uh, where it is as simple as you know, hitting run to compile a code base. Uh, so so that's, that's the goal we're trying to drive towards. Uh, we have made some pretty big improvements uh, in the space. Uh, you know, about a couple of months back, we released some of our work where we were able to train a very common model in uh, 47 minutes, which used to take several hours to train uh, earlier. Um, we, in this case, we specifically used eight of our uh, P3 instances. Um, and then we had a research uh, you know, group that actually built upon our work uh, to actually cut down even more where they're talking about 18 minutes time to train. So again, all of this is geared around helping you optimize your development flows, helping you take full advantage uh, of what ML has to offer and not gated by you know, either limitations on the infrastructure uh, or your overall stack. Uh, along similar dimensions, an announcement we made on Monday, which Andy uh, reiterated this morning, uh, was a new larger size in the P3 instance family, uh, which is specifically optimized for distributed training. Um, you know, it comes with uh, NVIDIA GPUs, uh, which have 32 gigabytes of GPU memory, which is 2x of what we had earlier. Uh, you know, we bumped up the, the CPU performance to help with data pre-processing. Uh, and more importantly, we have 100 gig connectivity from a network perspective to actually help all these nodes talk to each other in a really efficient manner uh, and also use it for sourcing data uh, to, to help train your models. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Adrian. And uh, Adrian, you wanna come on? Thank you, Chetan. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Geddon. I lead the machine learning team at uh, TRI and I'm here to uh, dive a little bit deeper into the details on the machine learning side. Um, and how we use uh, basically what, what Jaden talked about um, to do distributed deep learning in the cloud and for driving. And um, then Mike will, will dive a little bit more into the DevOps side of things. Uh, so let me see how this works. All right, um, but first, uh, before diving into the technical details, um, I want to start with why. So uh, this is, looks like nice like holiday pictures. Uh, this is from a, a little city in uh, Bulgaria that's called uh, Kula. 
and uh, has one little uh, peculiarity to it, uh, which is it has exactly uh, 3,287 inhabitants. So I don't know if you know what 3,287 means. Do you have an idea? It's, it's actually the number of uh, traffic fatalities per day worldwide. So this is just a ground, right? It's like 3,287. What does it mean? It's a bit hard to say. Well, this is a town that's basically being nuked every day on the road, right? So this is just to give you uh, a parallel. Another good parallel is it's like a, a 337 that's falling uh, and crashing every day. So this is why. Uh, this is why we are working on automated driving. Uh, there's like something like 20 to 50 million um, injured or disabled people in accidents. And, and really, the question that's, um, you know, um, here, it's a deeper question than just like, oh, prevent the death, and of course we want to do that, but why do we tolerate this in the first place? It's because we value freedom and mobility as a society, and we pay too high a price, so we should basically find a way, and that's what automated driving is about, to increase mobility and increase safety at the same time. And so that's really what we, we try to do at TRI, uh, so we're uh, a spin-off uh, from uh, Toyota, uh, that based in California, uh, in Michigan and in uh, Cambridge and Massachusetts. And we really are a robotics company um, that is working on trying to improve the human condition. It sounds very Silicon Valley, uh, I know, <laughs> but uh, we do mean it. And we do really um, uh, put our money where our mouth is. So like Toyota invested in total almost $4 billion in us um, to really, uh, and we spin up a new company called TRIAD in Japan. Um, and we really want to work on these aspects of safety. So we have a project called Guardian, uh, which is about uh, making a car that can crash, that can be involved in a crash. Um, and so it's the ultimate driver assistance system if you want. We also work on accessibility, so uh, mobility and, and chauffeur, uh, which is this uh, autonomous, like fully autonomous car, so level four, level five. It, this is really where we want to have full autonomy everywhere um, all the time. Um, the interesting thing there is that in the technology stack, and you'll see a little bit about it, uh, there's really a lot in common, so that's why we work on, on these at the same time. And we also do a lot of work on robotics, um, and especially uh, home robotics. Uh, we do also a little bit of work on material science, and, and we do all these things together because obviously they have synergies. And so I mentioned that uh, we work uh, on, on these problems and we're a robotics company. Um, so the, really the key thing is what is a robot? A robot is a sensory motor loop, right? All these systems, whether it's an autonomous car, whether it's a home robot, uh, they are actually a sensory motor loop, so which means that they uh, start with some sensors and then uh, you have to have some uh, algorithms, uh, typically deep learning to do perception, so understand the environment, then uh, predict how the environment is gonna change or reduce your uncertainty about futures, uh, possible futures, then plan to achieve your goals, make a decision, action, and of course there's feedback loops everywhere. Uh, and as I mentioned, there needs to be AI uh, uh, all, all, uh, for all these arrows and all these boxes. And um, a natural question to ask is what is AI? You hear that a lot, right? It's very, again, like coming to Silicon Valley, or that guy is talking about changing the world uh, with AI. It sounds like, again, an episode from the Silicon Valley show. Um, so as all good computer scientists would do, as all, all research scientists would do, when you have a difficult problem and you need to have a, a solution for it, the first thing you do is you Google for it. And so when you do, this is AI. Um, so AI is blue. Um, that's basically the definition that you would get from Google. So let's try it again. Uh, AI is actually machine learning. Um, one super cool thing, uh, by the way, is uh, in a keynote this morning, uh, you heard a lot about machine learning, whereas in other um, big companies, people would talk a lot about AI. But actually here, what, when we talk about AI in the modern day, we talk about machine learning. Uh, which is not like invented yesterday. So actually Arthur Samuel, which is a pioneer in AI, had um, basically had this nice definition of computers learning to solve problems without being explicitly programmed. So that's really the key word here is explicit. Um, there's a more advanced definition by Tom Mitchell that I really like and that I kind of paraphrased a little bit here. It's software, not magic, right? It's software that improves its experience by building a predictive model from sample data. Um, and uh, here, um, so I apologize for like two things that you can see inside these two remaining boxes. At TRI, we have these uh, Newton plus Hinton uh, philosophy, 
where basically there's a spectrum of uh, ML entanglement. Uh, ML can be used in a wide array of problems in autonomous driving in particular. Um, and that's, again, not new. Uh, so on the left side, you have supervised learning, uh, which is, you could term it as, we call it the, the Newton side. So it's engineer what you know. If you know about gravity, you don't need to rediscover F equals MA or, or Newton's law. Um, and that typically translates into modularizing your problem, decomposing the driving problem into sets of modules from which you understand uh, and you can engineer a solution. And um, uh, there is actually work on that that's from the late 80s and early 90s by Ernst Dickmans, um, uh, where basically there was this huge European project uh, to do uh, autonomous car uh, that drove on the highways in, in Germany and France uh, with a very modular system. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, so you have to imagine a little bit what's on the box on the right side, um, it's uh, actually end-to-end um, -end learning, uh, so which is this, this complete other extreme, which is you are not engineering the system into sub-modules that each have their own responsibilities and uses you know, good software engineering principles, separation of concern, and et cetera. Here, it's you're directly tackling the, tackling the problem with a single model. You're basically saying, what if driving, I define it simply as here's my sensory input, and here are my driving controls. If you see this, this is how you should drive. And uh, obviously, this simplifies a lot uh, the problem, um, and this seems a little bit hopeless and crazy because when you think about it, when you drive, a lot of cognitive processes, a lot of perceptual processes, uh, a lot of things that you learned in your life is used when you drive. But actually, this approach has the benefit of being extremely data-driven, um, and it works surprisingly well for real for you know, simplistic driving conditions like staying in the lane, et cetera. And there's, again, it's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there's old work uh, by Dean Pomelo at the end of uh, the 80s uh, and, again, early 90s at CMU, where they use a single neural network uh, to, you know, have a car that drives itself. And at the time, you have to understand that there was no, you know, um, digital cameras or things like this. They were using TVs. I mean, it was a crazy story. I really recommend you, you, you read upon this. It's really interesting. And that we call that the hint inside. So this is learn what you don't know. And this has an interesting aspect and related to the definition of machine learning that I, I mentioned before is that they can improve with data and because they're not explicitly programmed. So they can handle rare events as long as they've seen it in the data, even if the developer of the system hasn't thought about, oh, what if there's a deer at night on a crosswalk um, you know, uh, in, in close to Lake Tahoe? That my, do I have to program my system to handle that edge case? Um, obviously, you know, these are two extremes, uh, and that's why we call our approach Newton plus Hinton, where we, we use the best of both worlds. And so in the middle, again, you have to imagine that what's written in that box in the middle is uh, representation learning. And so representation learning is this middle ground where you uh, abstract the world to some extent with some representation that you learn, and that representation is actually an actionable representation that then you can use for, for planning, et cetera. So you're decoupling at some level in the middle, um, and the key question here, and it's actually an open research question, is what is a good representation of the world and of all the knowledge you need to drive what is a good representation that uh, uh, can make computers drive um, and, and cars drive themselves? Um, and so really, that's why we are a research institute. We're doing a lot of, of research on uh, spanning those two extremes because most of the space that's interesting is in between. Um, one quick uh, detour I'd like to take, which is a historical detour, if you don't mind, is, again, I've been saying nothing new under the sun. I know it's hard to um, um, necessarily appreciate this, uh, but um, I wanted to talk about a little uh, data science venture. Uh, if, you, if you want, it's a 17th century data science startup uh, that tried to understand the universe. Um, uh, you can imagine this in normal Silicon Valley speak today. Um, so uh, Tycho, uh, Tycho Brahe, uh, which uh, you can see on the left, uh, was basically an astronomer and an astrologer, uh, astrologer from the uh, 16th century, also an alchemist. And uh, he has been described as the first competent mind in astronomy, astronomy to feel you know, ardently the, the passion for exact empirical facts. So what he did is he actually collected a lot of data about movements of the stars with his eyes and just writing it down. And with that huge data set, then we had uh, a data scientist called uh, Kepler uh, from the 17th century that basically 
uh, tried to summarize and compress all that knowledge and all that data into a model. And that's, of course, Kepler's laws of motion. And after that uh, data science work, where he had a predictive model that was very helpful, uh, came Newton, uh, which was also an alchemist uh, from the 17th century, and basically uh, tried to prove uh, that the laws of motion had some, some theoretical validation. And of course, you, uh, you all know the laws of gravity in his Principia from uh, 1687. Um, and so really, this approach has always been uh, the scientific approach, right? The modern approach that you see about deep learning, the thing that I described about machine learning in the cars, is data plus alchemy eventually leads to a model. And we are very much right now in this era where we collect a lot of data. So if you run quick back of the envelope computations uh, about like uh, how much does a fleet of car, like Toyota's, you know, we have 100 million cars on the road. If they are 95% of the time parked, if they have a single camera and you subsample the data to just get interesting events, you get to 10x YouTube a day. Right, so, so the amount of data we collect right now is crazy, and we do a lot of alchemy on it with, with deep learning. Um, and eventually this will lead to a model, uh, a really beautiful model of understanding. Um, and so who will be the new Newton? We'll see. Uh, um, hopefully it will be us. Um, so uh, obviously uh, I mentioned that we are right now in this early stage of this approach. We're in the Tycho Brahe, like 16th century kind of like uh, time frame. And uh, the reason is because Although I started uh, the part of my presentation talking about how um, tragic uh, the, the, the price we pay for freedom of mobility today, uh, and it's 3,287 deaths a day, um, but we have actually an insane amount of miles traveled for these deaths. Um, so uh, we use cars a lot. and. This means that it's really hard to be better than a human uh, with a driving, self-driving car because you need to drive trillions of miles to be able to say with any statistical significance uh, that you are actually, let's say, 10x better, right? Um, there's no whole other debate that Gil Pratt, our CEO, uh, has been talking about for a long time, which is how safe is safe enough uh, when it's your 16-year-old daughter or when it's a self-driving car that's mass-produced and, and, and uh, shipped to the hands of hundreds of millions of people. It's a different debate. But in any case, if you want to show, not prove, because it's a statistical learning system, but if you want to show with some certainty that statistical certainty that your system is safe, you need trillions of miles. And if you look at it in a bit more details, um, of course, uh, we have test cars with professional drivers, everybody does, and that's how you can iterate quickly and define uh, you know, like new versions of your software and have this continuous deployment kind of loop, which is you know, a, a very classical approach to have very fast-paced progress in you know, Amazon or Google, like these web-based companies, because they are dematerialized in the real world, in the physical world, when your business is about physical robots, uh, it's much harder to have these fast iterations and to be lean. Um, but uh, that's why we have these professional drivers. And they're limited, right? Because they can only drive, like, let's say, millions of miles. Um, and that's the most, like Waymo, for instance, I think it's like eight or 10 million miles now. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, on the left side, uh, you have ordinary drivers. Uh, and that's millions of miles or, or even more, um, depending on, of course, most of the miles are boring, so you have to subsample a lot. Um, and so that brings you like really not even close to where you need to be to uh, have um, any, again, sense of how good you are at doing self-driving cars. And so obviously you need also simulation, right? And, and with a simulator, uh, you can do billions of miles. And one thing, and the reason we're here at AWS reInvent, is that with that amount of data and that amount of, of um, that number and heterogeneity of agents, right? Uh, ordinary drive, oops, ordinary drivers. Um, I don't know if I can get back to it. Uh, right. Let me get back to the previous slide. If we can. Oh, all right. Check. Sorry. Um, of course, you need, you need a cloud for this, right? Um, and Mike is gonna talk a little bit about storage side of things, uh, uh, because you can imagine these are like tremendous amounts of data, um, requires different patterns of connectivity, um, and, uh, and also that's just even to surface them up to people like me, uh, which are research scientists to develop the deep learning models. And so, um, and that's why I'm gonna talk uh, more about, okay, assuming you have all that, assuming you know what you're doing, you know why you're doing it, and you have access to this data, now there is a big 
technical challenge, right, uh, in addition to the research challenge, which is how do you enable fast turnaround time uh, for exploring new models, exploring new research ideas, validating them, shipping them into the car, and iterating. And, and that's like what I call lean deep learning. So you all know uh, about probably about lean um, and Toyota, Toyota production system. Uh, you know, there's this famous joke that says that Toyota is the best manufacturing company in the world. It just turns out they're making cars. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll, in the future, they will be making robots. And so lean is, is really uh, this idea of how can we really quickly iterate and get out of the building and get feedback from the real world. And so um, in particular for deep learning, and if you look at lean and the theory of constraints, you are wondering, where is my bottleneck? And how can I optimize my flow, my workflow, so that I maximize uh, the throughput through those bottlenecks or even replace these bottlenecks? And actually for us, uh, bottleneck is quite obvious. Uh, bottleneck is time. So um, clearly, uh, it's the case for everybody. We're all mortals, uh, except maybe Elon Musk. Uh, and so we have to optimize for time. And I just don't mean developer time in developing those models. I, I actually mean uh, several different things. So uh, runtime, uh, for instance. Um, so in self-driving cars, obviously, and robots in general, um, you have to have any time decisions uh, really fast-paced. So your sensors are fast-paced. Uh, your decisions have to be fast-paced. In driving, it's even harder than robotics, and let's say home robots, because those are several tons of metal going at you know, 65, 70 miles per hour. So the decision time is really, really critical, safety critical, and time critical. And so we obviously have to have small networks that fit. So this is our platform three, um, and this is one of our test vehicles. Uh, that we developed uh, recently. And in the trunk, what you see here is our compute box. Obviously, your compute, your compute constraint. You cannot have, I don't know, um, tens of P3 instances uh, in the back of the truck or like have very like small enough latency to drive just in the cloud. Um, so small networks is, is, is obviously uh, important. Uh, another thing that's actually really, really important is, um, is this weird equation that's almost like a, a relativistic equation, which is time is equal space. So um, for those of you that have a driving license, you know that when you learn to drive and you had a driver handbook, basically it said that uh, one of the key critical skills of a good driver is anticipation. Is you have to look far ahead to look far into the future. Um, because if you look far ahead, you will see things coming from afar. And so um, actually in deep learning, uh, when you make models like for object detection, um, and where, for instance, you want to do the task of panoptic segmentation, which is a very recently proposed task by, by Facebook, and we had um, some uh, recent model uh, and uh, finished runner-up at a competition with my team, where the goal is you start from this image, which is very high resolution, again, because you care about predicting objects far in the distance, and so you need a lot of pixels on these objects far in the distance. Typically, if you're less than 25 pixels, current deep learning methods are not working well, so resolution is kind of critical. Um, and what you want is to go from these images at very high resolution and predict uh, what their contents are. So this task is basically combining what's called semantic segmentation, which is what's every pixel in the image. Is it a road pixel? Is it a sky pixel? Is it a car pixel? And it's combining it with the task of instant segmentation, which is saying, where are the cars? Is that a car? Is that another car? Is that a truck, et cetera? So it's like this distinguishing between like what we call stuff categories and things categories, which are highly technical terms in computer vision. Um, and, um, so, and here, obviously, uh, resolution is a big problem because you have to make a decision for every pixel at a very, very high resolution. Um, another one, um, I don't know if the video is going to play. Oh, let me just try it. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. No, nope. All right, no look, you won't see any video. That's fine. Um, so uh, here, uh, again, you will have to use the power of uh, imagination. Um, uh, what you would have seen on the left is uh, uh, the previous model that was developed before us, which was operating at low resolution, because um, to go fast, you can reduce the resolution, but obviously you get a lot of artifacts, you get a lot of objects that you miss. And one of the big things that we did in, in that line of work is we um, increased uh, vastly the resolution, and we had to do a lot of work on making smaller models, 
Um, and there's also a lot of work on compiling those models to use uh, less precision, um, like uh, go from 32 bits floating point precision to let's say uh, int eight precision and these kind of things. Um, another uh, another uh, uh, problem that we tackled in the team is that also falls into this equation times equals phase is uh, high resolution for self-supervised uh, depth prediction. So. You might have heard about the sensor called the LiDAR. So in autonomous driving, there's a lot of different sensor uh, configurations that are possible. And although everybody's doing somewhat the same thing at a high level, uh, in the details, um, people are using different sensors for different things. Um, there's one thing that's very important, is perceiving how far objects are uh, from you. And that enables to do collision avoidance, for instance. And the typical sensor is this uh, laser-based range finder sensor. It's called LiDAR. And, um, and this is this big KFC buckets that you might have seen on top of the cars, self-driving cars that you see around the Silicon Valley, for instance. And so uh, one thing that we wanted to see is, can we predict depth from a single image? So obviously. Uh, if you think about it a little bit from a geometric perspective, you can't because there's a lot of ambiguities in the scene and a lot of different scenes uh, that can be recreated to be projecting on the same 2D plane. But uh, again, with data, think about Taika Brahe, in the real world, when you see a scene like this with the bicyclist and the traffic light and the lanes, there is most likely only one interpretation of that scene. And uh, what we do is we train a, a, a deep convolutional neural network to predict directly from a single image, uh, the depth of every pixel. So same thing here, space equals time, because if you have a lot of pixels, if you have a high resolution, you can predict objects far in the distance, and that enables you to reason about how, when they're gonna collide with you or not. And these are basically predictions from our system. Um, the cool thing about it is we can also recreate 3D maps. So the thing you see on the right is a point cloud that is not directly derived from a sensor. So these are not measurements from a sensor. This is a point cloud that is derived from directly the uh, images and our deep convolutional neural network. Um, uh, this is all work that has been published, so if you want more details, come and I'll show you the videos that didn't work, and I can also point you to the papers that we published. Um, so another uh, bottleneck, another way to go to lean deep learning is obviously training time, and we did a lot of work on that. Um, and although I agree uh, in this morning, uh, ski note was mentioned like inference time is probably the main, um, the main bottleneck, let's say, for uh, deployment of products. When you do research, uh, the main bottleneck is really training time because training these models can take days or weeks um, and they used to take months. Um, and now we can get to a point where they can take hours or even minutes as, as you've seen. Um, and so we did a little journey. So you see here these blue bars. Uh, this is not AI. This is blue, but this is not AI. Uh, these are training times. Um, and I will not reveal what's in these axes. This is basically our journey that we did last year um, and er earlier this year. And I'll, I'll explain you how we get there and reveal it at the end. So, um, so here's our, our setup. Um, we started from, um, you know, data is coming from the cars. It gets uploaded to S3. Uh, and then once we have a big enough data set on S3 um, uh, and we can label it or not, certain applications need labels, certain don't, like the segmentation that I mentioned needs uh, labels, the uh, depth prediction doesn't, it's self-supervised, it uses geometry as a supervision. Um, but it, once it's there, we have this data set on S3, uh, we used to actually do unholy things there, so S3FS, et cetera, you can ask Mike, he will relieve those nightmares. Uh, but that was easy, we were directly streaming uh, data from S3 to the CPU, and then to the, where we're doing, doing some image loading, image transformations, and then loading it onto GPUs, and then uh, crunching them into uh, deep convolutional neural networks um, and all the things you know and love. Um, and so the problem is that it was very slow. Um, and uh, we were, remember, we're using very high resolution images in the driving context. So, um, so we set up on a debugging journey and a performance optimization journey. So the first thing we did is obviously just, oh, it's very slow, let's add more CPUs. You know, just like, you know, more, more hammers. 
Um, and there's actually an easy way to do it. So I, one thing I forgot to mention is that we were using PyTorch. That's our main uh, framework uh, that we use at TRI. We were using a variety of different frameworks. Uh, we transitioned from TensorFlow to PyTorch, mostly because, again, on the research side, um, we wanted to have fast iteration. And this is basically for developer time. Uh, we found this is uh, way better uh, for us. And so in PyTorch, you can use like uh, data loaders and prefetching queues where you basically would have multiple, multiple processes uh, where, which would load the data in parallel and prepare it in parallel on the CPU and feed it to the GPU. It was better, but still not great, and that's what, you know, the normal way you would use PyTorch. Um, so then we thought, all right, um, you know what? Going from S3 to the CPU is probably not a good idea. Uh, so, um, you know, let's, we were probably network bound, uh, and we confirmed this with like some experiments, and we said, all right, let's move everything to uh, RAM disk, right? Uh, that's the obvious thing, is that if the data is already in the RAM, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the fastest it can be in terms of I.O. Um, and that was great, uh, still not perfect. And the main problem of that is that even though we have these monster instances that have a lot of RAM, so this can bring you quite far. So unless you have data on the order of terabytes or beyond, you can totally uh, do a lot of things with just this trick of, you know, put things on Devis HM. Um, so then, of course, when we had more data and we said, like, this doesn't scale, uh, uh, we moved to EBS volumes, um, and that was actually bad, and that actually got worse uh, when uh, the, the awesome new V100s came and the new P3s came, and we switched from P2s, which were K80 GPUs, to the blazingly fast V100s, and, uh, and now we were very, very I.O. bound. Um, and so uh, we went the extra step, which is we bit the bullet and worked directly with AWS and with our partners um, to basically use a distributed file system, which is essentially a distributed version uh, of the Devis HM trick that I mentioned before, uh, because most data is in the RAM. And so Mike will talk a bit more about that uh, in a minute. Um, and uh, we presented that at GTC earlier this year. And it was still taking days or weeks to train for us. So what we did next is uh, and not just distributing the file system, not distributing the storage, we actually went to the full, you know, distributed uh, learning. And you know this, like, I have 99 problems. I know, let's use distributed computing. Now we have 100 problems. Uh, so uh, that was also another uh, fun adventure. Um, and, you know, at the time, you have to remember, this was almost like six months ago, and uh, no ImageNet in two minutes, uh, no, you know, everybody at the time thought you can't do it in the cloud because you need InfiniBand, so you need customized, specialized hardware. Um, and, uh, um, but we were working closely with AWS, and we thought, hey, you know, let's, let's try to make it work. Um, and so we, uh, again, high resolution images, moving around the network, that's like uh, um, very complicated to see um, and optimize. Um, and so in the end, uh, we managed to optimize quite a bit. And one thing that was surprising was we were actually fork bound in the prefetching queues because now that we had a distributed file system that was fairly efficient and that we had many different instances with each eight GPUs, um, we found that uh, our epochs, so meaning the passes that you do over your training set, were very, very fast and setting up the, the workers for these prefetching queues turned out to be a bottleneck. So we're fork bound in a way. So we reworked the data flow and, um, and basically uh, not had to hack the internals of PyTorch or even worse, uh, the like NVIDIA stack further down or the, you know, change and move away from AWS. We just rewrote the, the, uh, the data flow and, and basically used infinite warm producers racing with consumers um, the challenge there uh, being that uh, we're on purpose allowing some race condition to happen, uh, which is, uh, you know, can create a deadlock uh, if uh, you're not careful. Um, so we're playing a little bit with fire there, but uh, that's the price to pay in HPC for it to be really fast. So um, training time, graph, now I'm revealing the axes. So on the Y axis, you see uh, the time per epoch, so the time for, for passes over the data set. And on the X axis, what you see is the successive iterations that we went through to uh, develop this distributed deep learning infrastructure on AWS P3 instances, where we moved from st stock PyTorch uh, data parallel and then basically added these extensions that I described, finishing all the way to the right with these multiple instances um, and um, these PyTorch hacks around uh, infinite warm producers. 
Um, and here, uh, if you want to get an inkling, uh, we went through a 16x uh, performance improvement by using 4x more machines. So it's a super linear speed up in a sense, and that's obviously only possible because we changed the algorithm. Um, and so um, that's really just, you know, like it's not just throw more machines at it, it's also rework the algorithm a, a little bit, uh, and then you can get beyond uh, linear scaling. Uh, and I'll leave it up uh, for uh, Mike to uh, continue uh, just after these conclusions uh, for the first part. So um, I mentioned automated driving. How do we do ML on a trillion miles, right? That's one of the challenges that, that really we're, we're trying to think about. Um, distributed PyTorch in the cloud, the reason we chose AWS, the reason we chose PyTorch, and the reason uh, we did all the uh, infrastructure work that we did is basically the mean to be lean, um, and we really want to go fast. Uh, we're gonna have a moral imperative to really develop these solutions and, and save those lives. Um, and, um, and just a thought-provoking uh, statement uh, for you to think about is, uh, we're really trying to think about what would be a Toyota production system for deep learning. So that's, that's really some of the questions that animate us. And Mike's dive, gonna dive a little bit more on the infrastructure side of things. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, can you tell I'm kind of the IT guy with my nice Hawaiian shirt compared to the nice suits over there? Hey, you gotta have a little bit of fun, right? So Mike Garrison, I'm the technical lead on the infrastructure engineering team. I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into both how we support people like Adrian and some other groups at TRI. So, you know, who are we? Well, I don't really wanna confuse you with the well-known browser. Uh, this is also why you don't let people like me attempt to name a team because eventually we just give up, go with something simple. A day later, someone's like, you really named it IE? And then all of a sudden Slack has a whole bunch of IE logos all around and they start referencing you as that instead. Eh. And what are we trying to do? Well, TRI was formed about three years ago and had pretty much explosive hiring and wanted to move fast. So at the time, there was a lot of freedom in the environment where people could do whatever they wanted and not necessarily something that scales. So earlier this year, the infrastructure engineering team was formed. And we're a small team, and it's still a work in progress, both as we learn as a team and we evolve as a company. But what we're trying to do is take away some of the pain points that Adrian talked about. You know, all those knobs that you can turn in configuring an EC2 instance, the options for EBS volumes, the things that I dream about or maybe have nightmares about in my sleep that are just second nature for me, they're a challenge for people who don't have much experience with AWS. So let's abstract it away from them, make it easier, help work with them to understand their problems, be like, hey, you should try this. Um, we wanna make it easier for folks at TRI to harness the power of the cloud. And we don't want to block them, we wanna enable them, let them focus on the research and development, let us focus on the cool things like the infrastructure. I mean, I guess deep learning is cool, but you know, it's mostly over my head. But why do you wanna do infrastructure as code? It's very important. Really, you know, it's the only way you can continue to stale. All made all the things. You know, I guess there's a joke, well, there is a joke pretty commonly for us DevOps engineers about automating ourselves out of a job. The good news is with new Amazon services, new challenges, you're really never gonna automate yourself out of a job. You're just gonna move on to the next interesting problem. But why do you wanna automate all the things? Well, you wanna reduce tactical errors. You wanna get rid of manual operations. And you wanna make it faster and easier for researchers and developers to be able to test their stuff. So, you know, a couple of different bullet points, which I gotta give credit to one of my coworkers. Uh, he actually helped me come up with this idea. Shout outs to Flock if you're in the audience. Uh, you know, Reproducibility, you can provision resources the same way. You don't have to worry about what was tweaked. You know, Adrian SSH'd in, changed something. Now he's like, hey, why did this break? I'm like, well, what did you do? Audibility, you have a trail of changes. For compliance, debugging, rolling back to previous known state is excellent. Again, if you did it manually, you're pretty much not gonna be able to do any of that. And scalability, if you can package all these up, it makes it easy to not have a handcrafted special snowflake. You know, you bundle it up, provision it, now you can throw in an auto-scaling group, and the ML engineers are gonna be super happy. And obviously, reasonability. When things break, you have a source of truth. You can figure out truly what the IP addresses are, what the configuration options are, packages that are installed, all that stuff. Uh, just a, you know, 
kind of brief example of some of the big tools we use. And Terraform and Ansible, along with Packer, are kind of our core workhorse there. That's really what you need to do to do infrastructure as code. And we also use Jenkins to power those pipelines. And then another cool tool that we use is Cloud Custodian by Capital One. Um, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to check out what Capital One is doing, they have a lot of really awesome open source projects. And you know, instead of having to recreate the wheel, it's great to be able to leverage solutions like that. And another tool I recommend if you don't like daily standups or you have a distributed team is a tool called Status Hero. Uh, basically, you can do your check-ins via Slack or via email, and it means you have a record and you can see who's blocked, and you don't walk out of your standup being like, who said what now? Now to the interesting part. How do we do our card to cloud communication? Uh, if you were in the automotive leadership session, you might have heard a little bit of this already, but I'll try to go into more detail. Uh, the real-time communication is small metrics. It powers an internal dashboard and you know, communicates over the internet. Think things like speed, distance, uh, duration, and other interesting facts that you might want to see on a dashboard. Afterwards, the SSDs in the car are removed, put into an ingest machine, and then that machine uploads to a local NAS. It's essentially our cache as we are able to upload it to S3. In the background, there's a VM that's monitoring that NAS, and then as it sees new objects, it uploads it over our direct connect to Amazon S3. We also post some metrics at the same time so we know when logs are getting uploaded, from what site, et cetera. Uh, when those objects appear in S3, an event is kicked off, and this event actually powers a couple of different things. Uh, one is it populates an Amazon SQS queue, and Let's say I'm at Ann in Ann Arbor, and someone uploaded logs there. Well, if I'm a developer at Cambridge or a researcher you know, at Los Altos, and I'm working on my local machine, I don't want to have to figure out how I get those files down from S3. So what this does is actually syncs it down to the NAS at both sites. Uh, and then they have a very similar experience regardless of what lo location you're at. And the next really cool thing it does is it also kicks, up our, kicks off our data pipelines. And before I jump to that, I wanna say it's interesting because on Monday, I think it was Monday, they announced AWS DataSync, which essentially is that drop-in VM that is probably gonna be able to replace a whole bunch of this infrastructure that we have. You know, it's pretty cool to be working on something like this, come up with it, and then here Amazon has a service that now you don't really have to worry about that portion of the infrastructure, move on to the next problem. The data pipeline. So as the object comes in, it triggers an S3 event that populates an SNS queue. Um, from there, we have some Lambda functions that decide what you're gonna do with that data. For instance, it might be something like you post a Slack notification. Or you might wanna populate an SQS queue that an autoscaling group runs from. And inside of that autoscaling group, it'll do things like image sampling, so that we can send those images to be labeled to help out folks like the ML team. You can process notes from the drive where the operators have logged things like, you know, massive pothole in Michigan that I just hit, or squirrel ran out in front of me. Okay, those aren't real things, but you never know with our operators. They do tag things that are of interesting, like, you know, stoplight or pedestrian or bicycle, just to make it easier to search. And additionally, this data pipeline feeds an internal dashboard that allows all of our members at TRI to search for these various logs. So if you're looking for a log from yesterday or three months ago, you know, it's easy to go to this dashboard and do, some, do a quick query, get a bit of sample of the route and say, yeah, that's really what I want. And it gives you a link to be able to pull that down to your local machine or where to find it on the NAS. Uh, and we also produce other artifacts. You know, we either upload a sample of the log to S3 that then triggers another team's data pipeline to work on it, or store artifacts in RDS. We also populate Amazon Elasticsearch dashboard with it. It's a you know, pretty cool pipeline. It's kind of homegrown. We're actually looking uh, to potentially replace this with uh, Airflow or something similar. Because you know, one of the big things is try to focus on what's special to your company and not the things that other people have done. And this works 
for the most part, but as we continue to scale and grow, and there are better solutions, and the community continues to mature, we try to leverage a lot of those common solutions out there. The ML clusters that Adrian was talking about. So you heard him reference InfiniBand. It was about a year ago that they came to me and they're like, hey, we need an InfiniBand cluster. We need it on-prem. We gotta get our iteration times down. And I'm like, why can't we do this in Amazon? In Working with my account manager, uh, who's standing at the way back of the room because they won't let Amazon people in. Hi, John. <laughs> and uh, Chayton and some other folks, we were connected with an awesome resource from ProServe. His name's Amr. You may have seen some blog posts over the course of this year about the BGFS cluster, and now he has a Slurm integration. And you know, working with him, he gave this prototype environment where we have a placement group that consists of the P3 workhorses and then R5s with their massive amount of memory. And inside of that, we run BGFS in an autoscaling group. We sync down the data from S3 and then it's in memory file system. You wanna talk about fast and a lot lower latency? This significantly improves the times as Adrian mentioned earlier. The other cool thing is it gives a nice little web interface into artifacts of like, sorry, metrics of CPU usage, GPU usage, you know, disk usage. So when they have an issue with the machine, they can either bug me or I can look into it for them. They can then use Amazon EFS for storing some of their artifacts or throw it into S3. Uh, this was awesome, especially the fact that we were able to work with another partner, Flux7, who helped us turn this into a product catalog item that they can deploy. Because now instead of them coming to the IE team to get a cluster, they can deploy it themselves and then destroy it later on, reducing a lot of our involvement. So I want to kind of wrap up a little bit with some tips and tricks here. I highly recommend focusing on the items that are unique to your organization. We were originally running our own Kubernetes cluster, and we switched over to EKS because it means we reduce the management burden. Originally, it was running our own Elasticsearch cluster before the Elasticsearch service, I would say, got more in step with the modern versions. Uh, now we don't have to worry about managing that, which is great. You know, all those common services, they might cost you a little bit, but the time they save in having management and I guess folks like the infrastructure teams having to manage something that Amazon can do is certainly worth the price. And learn from the community. Keep an eye on where things are going. I mean, from the keynote that you heard this morning, the introduction of the Luster, the managed Luster file system, we're gonna have to experiment with that and see if that's gonna be a good replacement for BGFS. But the important thing is you can never know what is going on if you're not involved in the community. There are very many companies out there doing interesting things, and even when you don't expect them to do something that might overlap with you, you'll know, the you you'll find out interesting facts. So I love reInvent because I get to talk to a whole bunch of people and be like, oh, you're solving a problem that I'm thinking about, and you know, how did you solve that? And it's great to learn more about that. Um, and then the other thing is leverage others to move quickly. So as I mentioned, Flux7, is Garov here and gonna shout or not? Whoa. All right, there we go. Uh, <laughs> so we were connected with them and they excel at infrastructure's code. Uh, behind the scenes, they've been working to allow us to get into a multi-account environment that's easy to manage, has all the basic security and access control in place that you'd want, and it's allowed our team to continue to focus on the day-to-day -day operations. We're gonna start moving over and transitioning to that new environment, but it's been, it's been awesome because really I had this idea in my head. I talked to a couple of folks and they connected us with Flux7. It was like, okay, well, they're basically saying the exact things I wanted to do and they know how to do it. So it's, it's really sped up our adoption of infrastructure's code and made our lives a lot easier. And of course, AWS, like, I really do want to give a shout out to both our team and ProServe because they've connected us with awesome resources that helped us to solve a lot of our problems. And they really are customer focused. Look at all the stuff they introduced today. It's a lot of things that customers are already trying to do or struggling with. Even yesterday, like the announcement of the transit, uh, I forget the name, transit gateway or whatever. We were working with uh, transit solutions and it's a big pain in the butt to be honest to, to deal with it. And it's a service that we can just now use and have abstracted away from us. So with, with that, 
I'm gonna kind of wrap up here, and if you wanna ask myself or Adrian any questions, uh, we're gonna be down the stage over there. We've got about five minutes, so we'll have to do it pretty quick because we gotta clear this room for other folks. But I'm gonna hand it over to Chayton to finish up, and thank you. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, unfortunately, we, we won't be able to take live questions, but again, like, uh, like Mike mentioned, uh, we're gonna be around the stage, so if you guys have questions, um, we're happy to uh, answer those. Uh, I do have stickers that I'm giving out, and you guys can cash those out for, uh, uh, for uh, more T-shirts. Not sure if you guys have enough. We can, you can get more swag. And again, I really appreciate the time uh, that Adrian and Mike took out to kind of come uh, present, uh, reinvent, share their story and their journey. Uh, and at least from the AWS side, you know, we are here to kind of empower developers like yourselves, de you know, developers like uh, Adrian and Mike to kind of deliver on their mission. So thank you so much. Have a great reinvent. Appreciate it.